So we've been really focusing on people that had very clear brokenness, and Jesus came to them and wrapped them in his grace and his mercy, and he healed them. But what about people that knew him, heard from him, were very broken, could have used his grace and his healing, but didn't accept it? There were those people. And our main example of that is Judas Iscariot. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, is how Judas was with Jesus and how that could have impacted him, but he chose to reject him, essentially. When we think of Judas, we think about that picture of betrayal and failure, and that's absolutely accurate. It's very true to who Judas was, but if we actually take the time to look at him as a person and his humanness, we look at his heart, we get to see a picture of someone who had such internal brokenness, even though they had everything externally together. They had all of the opportunity, but so much internal brokenness led him to reject the grace and salvation of Jesus. So before we begin that, I know that was kind of a heavy intro, <laughs> so um, we'll pray one more time and just center ourselves on the message today. Would y'all pray with me? God, we come before you once again. Um, thankful for this opportunity to talk about ways that we can apply what you are saying to us, to our lives today. God, it is not easy to be a follower, um, to, to exist in this world and resist temptation to sin and resist all the ways that we experience brokenness, but we ask for your blessing over us. We ask for your healing, your comfort, your peace, your protection. And we ask that whatever it is you're trying to say to us today, that we have open ears, open hearts, and are able to receive that message. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Um, we give you constant, constant praise for that gift and of that salvation. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so I had always thought about um, the fact that it was really strange that Jesus even chose Judas in the first place. Have you ever thought about that? He knew that Judas would betray him. He was aware of that, but he chose him to be one of the 12. So I thought, why, why did he need to be one of the 12 apostles? Why couldn't he have just been, you know, a follower, a friend, but not in the inner circle? And I wonder if it was because maybe he needed that as um, a motivator for the other apostles as they were going on to share their testimony. They needed some kind of driving force to be able to fully commit to life with him. But if you think about it, I mean, I thought about how the fact he's not the great, greatest guy, probably not the best pick for one of the 12, but then if you think about the rest of them, they really weren't like top tier humans overall across the board. All of them were kind of quirky in their own ways. So I wanted to look back initially at the process of how Jesus chose his 12. We know that he was very aware of the limited amount of time that he had on earth, so it makes sense that he would need apostles to carry on the message and spread the word after his ascension. But to truly be able to speak about that message, they would need to witness his miracles firsthand. They would need to hear his teaching and spend a lot of time with him. So obviously this was an important decision. And you'd think he would want the best of the best, but when they were chosen, it was kind of like when you're uh, choosing your team in dodgeball uh, in gym class in PE when you're a little kid. Um, and if you're like me, I was standing in the back. I wanted to be last because I was probably going to get out first anyway. So it's kind of like that. He's like, mm, sure, that's good. Yeah, I'll take you. I'll take James, John, Philip, cool. Um, Simon, I like you. You seem strong. Don't really like your name. Let's change it to Peter. Cool, you can come. And so he had this whole chosen list that just felt kind of like, why? What was the purpose? And if you go down the roster, everybody had something that was weird about them. So we're going to look to Scripture when it tells of the process of Jesus naming his 12. It's in Luke 6, verses 12 through 16. If you need a Bible and would like to follow along in the Bible itself, we have some for free in the center of the room here. Those are yours. They're a gift to you. You can take it, keep it, write in it, read it, um, take it home, give it to somebody else, bless somebody else with it, whatever you want to do. Those are for you. So if we turn to Luke 6, it says, One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Simon, whom he named Peter, 
Andrew, Peter's brother. I'm kind of sad that Andrew doesn't get a cool nickname. Um, just Peter's brother. That's okay. James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and then Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. So Peter and Andrew were a pair of brothers who had been fishermen, and from the way they're represented in Scripture, they're kind of rough around the edges, a little impulsive, a little bit dramatic at times, a little bit over the top. And James and John, who were also brothers, were supposedly so short on patience that Jesus nicknamed them the Sons of Thunder, <laughs> which I think, if I'm going to get given a nickname by Jesus, I want that one. I think that's the coolest one. There was Matthew, who was a former tax collector, um, who was completely despised by Jewish people because he was a tax collector for the Romans, and these were the people that were oppressing them. So he was already an enemy coming into the group. And then there was Thomas, who later became nicknamed Doubting Thomas because he didn't believe that Jesus had risen. It took him some time to understand who he was speaking to. And then there was Simon the Zealot, which I think is interesting that he got to be Simon, but then he also had a tagline of the Zealot. It's a whole thing, a lot of names going on. Um, but Zealots are rebels, and they are people who at the time hated the Romans so much that they wanted them completely thrown out of the land. So it's easy to see why he would have gravitated toward Jesus, who was supposed to be this almighty conqueror. And I think he thought that he would drive the Romans out. Then there was the other Judas, also called Jude sometimes, also called Thaddeus, whole lot of names happening. He's all lots of places, same person. And then finally, there's Judas Iscariot. So each of these other men were definitely not what you'd expect Jesus to choose initially, but you can see a progression for them in their faith as you read through scripture, how they grew, how they embraced Jesus' message, how they really pursued faith, and they learned the true nature of God. They all went on to be heroes of the faith in their own way, except for Judas. So why did he choose them? He knew that Judas would betray him, and I, I think that that is a large part of it. He wanted them to see that betrayal and what happened from that. Um, but I think even though he knew that Judas would betray him, he still loved him so deeply. And I almost feel like there was a part of him that just wanted to let him know he was loved before he made that choice. And whatever the reasoning is, I'm sure that that wasn't easy. Because even though Jesus is God in the flesh, he still had that full experience of humanness. So he still had emotions. He still had uh, normal responses to situations. And it must have deeply hurt him when those that were closest to him failed him. Have you ever had somebody just throw you under the bus? That you're just like, uh, I thought we were cool, and here I am, and you've just totally thrown me out to the wolves. Awesome, thank you so much. Every one of us has probably had something along those lines where we have felt betrayed by someone, and it hurts. It deeply hurts. So Jesus had to walk alongside Judas every day, still love him, still work with him, still try to teach him, still impart his grace and his blessing upon him, knowing that he was going to turn on him eventually. That had to have been so hard for him. And all through the Gospels, these 12 men are not stellar, stellar followers of Jesus. They were slow to grasp Jesus' messages. When you read the Gospels, you're like, okay, here we are again. You still don't get it. Still don't have faith. Still not trusting. Okay, we get it. And Jesus just has ultimate patience for them. He repeats the message as many times as it takes for them to get it. They were impatient with him at times. They were angry at him at times. They had their own agendas that they wanted him to pursue, and when he didn't, it made them mad. They argued amongst themselves. Some of them did not like each other, and we can imagine how frustrating it must have been for Jesus to put up with that. Probably like, kids, settle down. Get it together. He just had a constant turmoil around him, and in the end, yes, they did get a grip. They did serve their purpose. And he had set that out for them, and they lived into it. In time, they all realized they could do nothing but open themselves up to the fullness of living for Christ, all except Judas. 
Just like them, Judas was called by Christ to be a follower, a disciple, and eventually an apostle. Judas witnessed the miracles of Jesus firsthand. He saw the feeding of the 5,000. He heard the Sermon on the Mount. He saw Lazarus be raised from the dead. He even participated in his ministry, helping others, healing others. So I can't imagine experiencing that and not being completely devoted to Christ. But I can only speak for myself and my heart and what I think would happen. Judas did not have that experience. His story shows us that being close to Jesus, hearing his words, and witnessing his works does not necessarily transform the heart unless we allow God to work in us. Judas had proximity to Jesus, but not surrender. So at the end of the day, we can do and say all of the right things. We can lead seemingly perfect lives. But if there's a heart issue, there will be major connection problems in accepting that grace and that salvation and committing yourself to God. Um, a scholar I love, F.F. F. Bruce, said, Judas had the same potential to become a great witness for Christ as the other disciples, but the desires of his heart led him down a different path. So what led to that process? How does one go from being a chosen apostle to being a betrayer? The Gospel of John, verses 4 through 8, gives us that insight in Judas's character and his actions. And this is the passage that tells of a woman who poured perfume on Jesus' feet and, and cleansed his feet with that perfume. So after she's done this, it says, But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And I love, I think I've said it before, I love the Gospel of John because he speaks my language, he keeps it real. He adds those little tidbits there and he's a little bit snarky about the way he says things. Um, he adds tags onto what he witnessed to give us a deeper understanding of each situation. He may be emotional, but he understood the need to represent that additional perspective in his account of knowing Jesus. So he makes that comment of, not that he cared for the poor, he was stealing all the time, he was doing all these things. And it helps us understand that Judas said the right things. Shouldn't we give this to the poor? Shouldn't we take care of the poor? But internally, he had not had any heart change. He didn't really care for the poor. He was greedy. It illustrates how even those who were considered to be the best of the best still struggled with sin on a regular basis. Judas was selfish. He was greedy. He was judgmental. And in his ability to not overcome those temptations to sin, it slowly hardened his heart and it gave the enemy a foothold. His love for himself and for money completely overshadowed his love for Jesus. So what started as these small compromises, these small acts of selfishness, of greed, of, of judgment, that turned him away from Jesus himself. It led to the ultimate betrayal for just 30 pieces of silver later. So this teaches us a valuable lesson that proximity to Jesus doesn't guarantee transformation. Surrender does. I grew up in church. I knew everything that I was supposed to know as a kid who um, could rattle off scripture because I went to Sunday school every Sunday. They gave us stickers every time we could repeat a memory verse. And so my Bible was full of stickers, just top to bottom, all over the place. I knew everything I was supposed to know. My parents raised me with faith. I eventually went to a Christian university. I was surrounded by people of faith all the time. So I felt like I was the best example of what a disciple of Christ should be. But I can tell you, if you know my story and you know my background, I can tell you that even I went through years of darkness, years of refusal to surrender my sin to Christ, rejection of faith, doubting God, doubting his plan for me, doubting Jesus, and hating the idea of thinking of myself less than I thought of him. 
I was the epitome of selfishness for years. So I can tell you that showing up on Sunday, surrounding ourselves with all of the right people, saying all of the right things, it does absolutely nothing if we're unwilling to fully surrender our heart and control of our life to God. Point blank, period, end of story. I could stop the teaching right there, but I won't have more to say. But that is something that I felt so blown away by when I was thinking about it. If I did not eventually surrender my life to Christ in every sin, no matter how big or small I thought it was, I was not going to fully change my life and be transformed by Jesus. So Judas probably felt like this ultimate superstar. He was like one of the 12. He probably had this self-confidence of, look at me, I'm one of Jesus' chosen. I'm excellent at faith. You can ask me anything. I'm amazing. But underneath it all, he had sin that went left unaddressed. So he made those small compromises. He allowed temptation to grow in the dark, and he never openly exposed it to the light of Christ. Those small acts of dishonesty, those small moments of giving in to selfishness, that became his destruction. He stayed broken. And in James 1, verses 12 through 15, it tells us what happens if we follow that path. He writes, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So temptation comes from our own desires, which leads to sin and then grows and grows and grows and only ever leads to death. So God could have blessed Judas if he had endured the temptations of his human nature. And we all have them. We all have desires that are woven within our human nature and our DNA. And some of them we can use to help us grow, but some that are really deeply destructive and Every sin starts with that desire that goes unsurrendered to God, unexposed to God. God knows that we have those sins, which is why he grants grace for it, but we have to be willing to remove it, right? We have to be willing to let him see it and take it and turn it around. So our desire for God must become greater than our desire for self. The times that we feel like, I've got this, I can handle this, I don't need God, I don't need anybody else, it's just me against the world. That has to take a back seat to trusting God, to trusting that he will bring you to where he is calling you to. It took me years to learn that, and it actually took me becoming a mom, I think, to truly understand what overcoming selfishness can look like. And trust me when I say I still struggle with it. Selfishness is just a natural part of my being. Um, There are times that it wins. But I try really hard to turn it around, and I try to say, yep, I was being selfish. Let me backtrack. Let me start over. Let me try again. And I feel like having that knowledge that God gives me grace when I have those moments helps me turn it around and try again. We all are going to have battles with our temptations until we are freed from our earthly bodies. We are going to battle temptation all the way till the end. But there will come a time when we can recognize just how much serving God blesses us so much more than serving ourselves and our own desires. If we want to overcome any temptation that we may have, it has to be fully surrendered to God over and over again, as many times as it takes. And Judas never did. So we don't know where and why Judas officially decided to betray Jesus. Perhaps it genuinely was just for the money. Maybe he assumed that the Romans would capture Jesus eventually anyway, so he thought, well, I might as well profit from it. Maybe that was enough for him. But I also wonder if other resentments and frustrations added to that decision. Another biblical scholar, N.T. Wright, um, shared a thought about this in a podcast. It says, Judas likely expected a Messiah who would overthrow the Romans. And when Jesus did not meet his expectations, Judas may have seen betrayal as a way to force Jesus' hand. 
So in this light, Judas' disappointment with Jesus may have fueled his desire to take matters into his own hands. So the Old Testament taught that the Messiah was going to be someone who was powerful, all-conquering. He was going to completely overcome the world and conquer kingdoms, and he was going to destroy oppression. He was going to free the slaves, anybody who needed a savior. And it was natural for people to read that and take it literally and think that, well, he means earthly kingdoms. But what they didn't understand was that God meant heavenly kingdoms, the entire of the universe, Everything in creation was what he was going to conquer, and he was going to do it in a way that was unexpected. But Judas was one of many who thought that the Messiah is supposed to come back and fight against the Romans who have conquered our land, and they have oppressed us for years, hundreds of years, and so these are the people that he's going to overthrow. So maybe it was a strategy that he was like, you know, Jesus, Jesus is over here, he's wasting time, he's loving people, healing people, talking to people, trying to like help them lead to faith. Um, what a waste of time that is. Let me just see, maybe if I give him to the Romans, maybe that's where we'll see him just like bust out and he'll fight back and he'll conquer the Romans that way from the inside. Maybe that was it. We don't know exactly what it was, but I wonder if he had that feeling of, disappointment in Jesus, um, betrayal, because Jesus wasn't doing the things he thought he was supposed to do. He had this expectation that Jesus didn't quite live up to, and he couldn't understand why that was happening. So maybe he felt lied to. Maybe he felt used. So his response was then to give Jesus to the people that he hated most. So going back to Luke in chapter 22, verses 3 through 6, it shares how this impacted his decision. It says, Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples, and he went to the leading priests and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted, and they promised to give him money. So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. So Judas allowed Satan enough of a foothold from those small compromises to eventually completely come in and overtake his heart, overtake his choices. So then Judas became an active part of the plot to destroy Jesus. He was looking for an opportunity. It wasn't just a, here's the plan right here and now. No, he waited and he observed and he observed. And we don't know how long it took for him to find the right opportunity to destroy Jesus. It was a calculated plan, and his heart had to have been so cold and hardened at that point to be able to go through life with Jesus day to day, looking for an opportunity to betray him. So going back to John, John 13 shows when that happened, and it leads us to the Last Supper. John 13, verses 1 through 5 says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. So Jesus loved his disciples to the very end, including Judas. He knew exactly what was coming, exactly what Judas had done to betray him, and he knew that he had given in to the devil's temptation officially. So any normal person would have kicked him out, would have been like, get up, you're not eating dinner, I don't want to feed you, get out of here. But Jesus is not normal, he's God. So what did he do? He washed Judas' feet along with every other person there. He washed his feet. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King of Kings, he humbled himself as an act of service, teaching each of them that no one is better than the other, no one is more valuable than the other, that his grace and love pours out over all of them. It covers them and makes them clean. It was this visual representation of the sacrifice that he was about to make, not only for them, but for all of mankind. And he didn't just do it for the ones that were going to stand by him. He did it for the one that betrayed him too. So he has the opportunity available for everyone, even the ones who reject him on a daily basis. He still is there, still loving, still available. 
So scripture then goes on to describe how the arrest occurred as Judas leads the Roman soldiers to Jesus. They take him away to stand before Pilate to determine his fate. And the next passage that I want to look at, and I know we're doing a lot of scripture today, but it's important to see how it all ties together. So we're looking now at Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 10, which says, Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? They retorted, that's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. The leading priests picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury, they said, since it was payment for murder. After some discussion, they finally decided to buy the potter's field, and they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. That is why the field is still called the field of blood. And this fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah that says they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, and purchased the potter's field as the Lord directed. So that shows us that Judas realized that Jesus had been condemned to death, and he instantly regretted what he had done. So maybe he thought that the Romans would just simply imprison Jesus, that they would um, give him some lesser punishment. Maybe they'd only beat him a little, as if that's better. He's, that's fine. But when he realized that they were not only going to kill him, but they were going to crucify him, which was the most brutal, agonizing form of death, it seemed to almost wake him up. And the hold that the devil had on him was immediately released to be replaced by sorrow and shame, so much that he could not bear it, and he ended his life. We know that other people failed Jesus regularly. Even Peter um, denied knowing Jesus three separate times out of fear that he would be captured. But his betrayal led to repentance, which led to redemption. And Judas's betrayal led to regret. And what is at the heart of regret? It's selfishness. I feel sad for what I have done because what it means for me in this circumstance. And that led to ruin. So the difference in their two responses is so critical for us to understand. Regret and repentance are not the same because regret leads us inward while repentance leads us back to Christ. Judas lived this broken life of selfishness and sin, and it went unhealed. And even in his death, he was so focused on his own pain that he didn't consider any alternative, how he might have gotten grace, how he might have turned it around. We know, and he likely knew, that Jesus Jesus would have forgiven him. He likely already had. After all, forgiveness is the entire purpose of Jesus' mission. Judas had every chance to change and embrace salvation, but to the end, his temptation towards self-reliance led to isolation, led to despair, and he chose to stay broken. So the sad news about the story of broken people when we're focusing on Judas is that his story ended in tragedy. But the good news is that our story doesn't have to. You see, when we can learn something from this person's brokenness, we can Learn to do it better. Learn to do it differently. So here are a few lessons that we find when we look at the life of Judas. We learn, number one, guard your heart from sin. Judas's heart was completely unguarded. To our knowledge, he never really accepted the grace that was offered to him. He never openly acknowledged his struggles and asked for help. He never worked to change his habits. He never worked to overcome temptation. So that sin took root. And it grew and grew until it overpowered him and gave Satan the freedom to control him. Judas was close to Jesus every single day. He walked alongside him, served him, listened to him, yet he didn't truly commit to his way, and that caused destruction. So guard your heart from sin. And then we learn that serving is a start, but surrender is the goal. So proximity to Christ is not enough. Judas was physically close to Jesus, but his heart was far away. So when we serve, we absolutely learn to live like Christ did. And when we surrender ourselves, we give him control and we challenge those areas of sin that we may struggle to let go of. We learn to love like Christ did. 
And I don't say that lightly, like it'll be easy. I don't think that you give your life to Christ and whoop, magic wand, you're better. You don't sin anymore. Not true. You will sin over and over and over again. You have to learn the lessons over and over and over again, but it's about surrender. So just like Peter, who was the disciple that Jesus chose to lay the foundation of his church on, yet still struggled with fear and doubt, we will fail. But he always worked to get back to what Jesus was calling him to. So Peter and Judas both failed, but only Peter returned to Jesus for forgiveness. So we come to understand that when you feel regret, choose repentance instead. Take it out from looking at yourself and turn it towards looking at God, what he can do in that moment. Jesus' arms were open to Judas, grace was available, and he could have offered Judas a new beginning, just as he does for us. Restoration is always available, but we have to choose it. God's love is unconditional, and it doesn't expect perfection. It expects persistence. It's not about how far we fall or how many times we fall. It's about how we get up, and we work to do better each time. We can sit there and wallow in our struggles and say, woe is me, I made a bad mistake again, I gave into sin again, I gave into temptation again. Or we can get back up and we can say, Lord, I'm here, I'm broken, use me anyway. We can turn ourselves back to Jesus. So that teaches us that your response to failure defines your future. You don't ever have to be trapped in that cycle of sin. No one is too far from grace if we accept it and we take the steps to walk in it, but it starts with taking an honest inventory of where you are in your spiritual health. And friends, I am so serious when I tell you that we have to stop regularly and take a deep assessment of our hearts. We have to identify the sins that we struggle with, confess them to God to ask for his help, confess them to each other, people that we trust, because we need one another. We need fellow believers to speak into us and encourage us and help us redirect and challenge us. We need that community. We have got to seek repentance from every sin, no matter how much of a hold it has on us. Because even if it seems like a small issue now, if we don't address it each time, it's going to take root and it's going to grow until it destroys us, just like it did to Judas. And I wish I could say that we all eagerly respond to the Spirit when it challenges us. I wish that we all consistently pursued Jesus no matter how hard it gets. But Judas's life shows us that some people prefer to be broken. Some people prefer to be broken because acknowledging sin requires vulnerability. It requires enduring pain in order to overcome it. It requires daily effort to push past temptation. It requires deep humility. It requires rejection of self and embracing the Savior. It requires resisting constant attacks from the devil who wants more than anything to take control of your heart. So let's be honest. Some sins are difficult to let go of because they're fun, right? Some sins make us feel good. We wouldn't be tempted by them if that weren't true. So as much as we say we want to remove sin from our lives, the truth is that we can't defeat the demons that we enjoy playing with. We cannot defeat the demons that we enjoy playing with. If it feels good and we keep gravitating back toward it because it's fulfilling something in our humanness, we have to learn how to separate ourselves and find joy in God and his promises rather than this momentary satisfaction. It's going to be hard. It's going to be the hardest thing we'll ever do, but it is so much easier to stay broken and we have to reject that. If we have learned anything from this series, I hope it's that on the other side of brokenness is blessing. So as hard as it is to work through the process of healing, the life that Jesus offers is so much greater than anything we could experience that sin leads us toward. No matter where we are in our faith, no matter how well we follow Christ, we all have sin that we're working on surrendering. So I'm going to do something slightly different than our normal pattern today as we close. I want to pray right now. And if there is something, it doesn't have to be this massive dark secret that you're hiding, but if you have any sin that you can feel in your life, maybe you're, you're quick to anger. Maybe you're quick to irritation. Maybe you're quick to gossip. Maybe you're quick to um, ignoring situations that need your attention. Maybe you struggle with 
not having the energy to get up and, and ask God to join you in your day. Maybe you struggle with prayer time. Whatever it is that you struggle with, I want to take a moment and let's just ask God to address that in us today. Would y'all pray with me? So God, today I ask for strength to surrender. We come before you, all of us broken in different ways, all of us battling sin that wants to have control of our hearts and our lives. And just as scripture taught us through Judas, Satan looks for any opportunity to get sin, to take root so that it can grow. God, we ask that you help us look deep inside ourselves and take an honest inventory of what we can't seem to let go of. We ask that you take our brokenness that you move in our hearts and you push us toward restoration. That if we feel regret for past failures, you give us the comfort and the strength to release that shame, to repent and move forward. That we surrender all of it to you, our past struggles, our current struggles, tomorrow's struggles, we give it to you to control and we trust you to guide us. Please help us to recognize the ongoing process that is healing Help us to embrace the opportunity that we have in Jesus' transformative power. That we don't just show up on Sunday out of habit or routine. That we show up because we want to constantly be growing more and more in your likeness. Help us overcome that. It's in Jesus' love and grace that we honor you and we pray. Amen.